11, so circuit, let's okay. get started. Okay, maybe we can slide the door a little bit. Not completely closed. Just so we can focus and others can also do their stuff. Sitting in Joe's presence. <laughs> All right. So. I don't know if this will work. You know the latest news? Fall break has been cancelled. Oh no! No, oh, no! Dang it. <laughs> I, I can't believe you're the first one we're hearing it from. <laughs> I did it last. Um, a student just said, Well, I will miss your classes for one week. He <laughs> 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 didn't even think. Two seconds, he just had the answer. Well, I'm going to miss class. <laughs> okay, we all look forward to it, but let's wrap it up very nicely. Is that okay? And that's part of why I shifted homework due, um, homework due tonight to Saturday so that you have enough time to do it. And if you are not able, we can also extend it. I mean, it's to make it doable, right? Okay. Conserve quantities. And usually people have taken classical mechanics before they take quantum. Makes sense, right? So whoever met her in classical mechanics? Yeah. Very good, yeah? Good for it, Joey. And uh, Jared? Yeah, I forgot her name, but Emily Nother. Emily Nother. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful <laughs> conservation we love theorem. theorem. Yes. Oh, yeah. Emily Nother's theorem yeah. works yeah. in... Quantum mechanics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And briefly, since you already know a bit about it, let's start with that. What does it say briefly? Yes, Joey. Symmetries correspond to conserve. Exactly. Symmetry. If I find, thank you, thank you. That's correct. If I find translational symmetry, here is what Joey means. If I find translational symmetry, meaning if I do the experiment here, the result I get is not different from here. So that's translational symmetry in space. It means something is conserved immediately. What is that? Translational symmetry? Sorry? Would that be momentum? Momentum. Linear momentum. If I do it facing you, I get the same result as turning this way and getting the same result. What is conserved? Okay, what is the symmetry? If it doesn't matter whether I do it this way, or this way. Rotate, what is the symmetry? Rotational. Rotational symmetry. There is angular independence. Therefore, angular momentum is conserved. Super powerful. <laughs> that is physics at the deep level with mathematical explanation. So we are trying to do that in quantum mechanics. And we will make use of what you've done in your reading. So time-dependent quantum mechanics. We want to see quantities that are conserved irrespective of, well, Translational symmetry, rotational symmetry, and the last symmetry that is common, I've not shown. If it doesn't matter whether I do it at the start of class at 11 a.m. or tonight at 11 p.m., I should get the same result in my lab, right? Time independence. So what symmetry is that? I've already hinted at it. There's symmetry in time. And what is conserved? If there is time translational symmetry, I get the same result irrespective of the time. First, it was linear momentum, then angular momentum, and now what else? What else? What else can we conserve? Energy. Energy. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good start to a great class, I think. And that's because you guys also know your stuff and appreciate it. So good job. Thank you. So today, we will make sure that we cover the things I promised, namely taking the time-dependent Schrodinger equation further to deriving the time dependence of expe expectation values of dynamical variables. That's what I said last. And also matrices, yeah, explicit matrices. We've done derived notation. We've used the kets and bras, which are vectors. And now we want to do the matrix elements, and I have examples. So it's up to you. Which one do you think? And all of them are needed for the homework due on Saturday. So 
I like to start with doing on the board and then we do class exercises. But if you want to change order, I'm fine with that. But people are not in. So let's do the derivation of the Aaron first theorem, which you need for the um, one of the homework and things like that. <coughs> Okay, so just remind us, and I know you are looking at this, so good job. Yeah, we use this a lot. It's like the last postulate. Between measurements, the state vector evolves according to time dependent Schrodinger equation. That's what we get. We've seen lots of examples. So we're going to use it as well, even for the Aaron first theorem today. And that's the summary of the Aaron first theorem but I'm going to do it on the board and make it very explicit. The book presents it, but skips some steps. And you need those steps for the homework. I'm going to show it. It's almost going to be like the commutation of position and linear momentum, XP. If you, we didn't do it in class, it would be hard for you to kind of use it when you use it in the previous homework. So X comma P minus, so XP minus PX. We use the wave function and showed it explicitly in class. And that helps in so many other problems we've been solved. So we're going to do the same thing explicitly so that it will be easy for you to apply it. It's almost like even the proving that once normalized, the wave function stays normalized. Many of those steps keep recurring again, as you've seen. So when I choose to show details on the book, it's because it applies to so many things that we will do, including your homework and stuff like that. So let's move straight to deriving this Aaron first theorem explicitly, which we need for that homework problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can be like, Oh, what's going on there? But I will not be looking at that. <laughs> so what number are we, please? 27. Number? 27. 27. Okay. 27. What should we call it? Um, it's about Aaron first theorem. Aaron first theorem. Which... Our author, Griffiths, calls generalized, yeah, because originally Aaron first did it only for position and linear momentum. He connected position and linear momentum with force and potential energy. So he didn't generalize it to all dynamical variables, so generalized in our case. So why are we doing it? So that I can put it here. Why are we doing it? What does it give us, please? The, uh, Go for it. Expectation value. <laughs> Leave the book. Let, let's talk. You have it. Go for it. The, uh, I heard, I saw your lips. Expectation value, time de dependence. Yeah. I was going to say energy, time, uncertainty principle, but... It leads to it. It has application in it, which is important. Yeah. Let's put it. And it's also, yeah, it has application in that we are doing time dependent quantum mechanics. So let's call it. Um, I like the symbols. <laughs> let's just write the symbols and you see what we mean. Is that okay? <laughs> We're saying that if we have. A dynamical variable such as Q, yeah, we can take the expectation value and we know what that is, right? We can write it psi Q. So let's make it explicit as an operator. Yes. And we're saying, here is what I wanted to put in another in other words, that the time derivative of this, yeah, should tell us 
something about conserved quantities as time goes on. That's the point. So the, what is the time derivative of the averages from our previous work? Zero. Very good. Correct. And that's what we want to show now. Yeah. Yes. If the time derivative of the expectation value of position is not zero, we're in trouble. How did we go about proving it earlier on? Just to connect with earlier on, earlier on, so I can do earlier on a little bit. It's a bit of digression, but I think it is necessary so that people kind of connect. We said something like this, of position, yeah, was what? Integral, yeah, go for it. Thank you. That's what we say. And we knew that equals what? One. Very good. Such that the time derivative of this picks up the time derivative of this. And since this is one, and we knew how to show that this is zero, then the expectation value that relies on this is also, the, the time derivative of the expectation value of this also becomes zero. And our argument was x has no explicit time dependence. Because by the time, so x is not x of t. Our argument, yeah, you got it, that's the point. <laughs> Can I continue? <laughs> Everyone's just like, yes, I, so let's do a zero. Show. That's what we want to show. So how do we go about it? Same. Okay, let's expand it thoroughly. Product rule, right? Just give it a name. Product rule. Apply product. So product rule applied to this up expression. You help me. Let's go for it. D expectation value. DT will then be equal to, I start and you continue, partial psi, partial t, yeah, of q hat psi, the cat, plus, take over, please, go for it. Who tells us the second term? There will be three terms, so who tells us the second term there? Okay, I agree. So, bra psi, yeah? Oh, yes. Bra yes, psi. thank you. Partial derivative of q with respect to Partial q. And then psi. Ket psi. Thank you. Plus, it's another one. Okay, so this is the grace term, right? <laughs> Let's get another term. In the <laughs> Who goes for the last one here, maybe? Bra psi. Oh, okay, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Brassai. Thank you. Thank you. Q. And then partial psi, partial t. K. Partial psi, partial t. Thank you. We've got our three pieces. Let's make this easier for us. I don't like trying to cram everything in my head. I just want to show it on my with my hands. Show it clearly. Since we see partial psi, partial t, let's use the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Time dependent Schrodinger equation. So let's write it so that we can just insert them clearly and make fewer mistakes if at all. So IH bar partial psi partial t equals what? H bar psi, right? So clearly it implies that partial psi. Partial t equals what? 1 over i h bar h hat, the Hamiltonian operator, psi. So this is what we're going to insert. I like to put this in a little bit of... <coughs> yeah. Okay. Let's insert that without much ado. Okay. 
Pasha Sai Pasha the tea. But it is a burn. What's going to happen? Yeah. What will it be? Let's insert it. Okay, let's start this way. I give up. Yeah. Should work. Sign. Feel that. Sign. Plus. So we've got our sign. Partial Q. Partial T. And psi stays there. Plus what? Yeah. We just inserted 1 over i h bar h psi. Okay. Next step. What should we do? Not bad. What's the next step? If you answer it, then we name it after you. <laughs> yes, Millie? Can we try to conjugate either the first or the last term? Ah, the conjugation, that's the Millie step. That's correct. We are going to find a way of making a commutation. And so we Millie says conjugate, which is okay, because it means we take something out of this complex conjugate. Yeah, so she's right. So the Millie step, try to get something out of the bra so that you end up being able to get the commutation. Is that okay? So what will happen if we pull out this constant out of this bra? What does it become? Negative. So we've got one over negative i h bar. I don't want to skip steps because if I do, <laughs> there, will be, <laughs> there will be confusion. But you're going to permit me to condense something right away. Can we condense this a little bit? What will it be in condensed form, please? We wrote it at the start. So in condensed form, expectation value of of the time derivative of k, partial time derivative of k. So let's condense it. Partial q. Okay, now the stuff. <laughs> let's see if we can get it. Why did it do that? Okay, so we're going to continue on the board. Yeah, because it is stuck. You saw? Let's continue on the board. Who has the. Glad we have the board. So who has the camera thing? Yes. And we can be looking at what it is showing so that we have it right. Okay. So are we together? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's continue step four. I'm going to rewrite step four here. Step four. We've got enough room. Step four. So continued. Continued. The four was dq hat dt equals. So we got negative um, one over i h bar bra h bar psi. So the Hamiltonian operator. Then, what was it here? Q and our ket. Plus what we just condensed, partial Q at partial T, the expectation value. Do you agree? Oh, thank you. Yes, so it's expectation value of this Q right there. Thank you. Great. That's important. <laughs> yes. Plus 
then you want us to pull out the IH bar as, as well? Yeah. Thank you. So 1 over IH bar psi. Where is the H going to be and where is the Q? If we mix it up, this is why we are doing it thoroughly. If we mix the positions of the H and Q, we're not going to get it right. So what is here first, Q or H? Q. Very good. We have to keep it. And we can always pull the H out here, yeah? Because that's how it works. Any questions so far? All I'm saying is that H... <coughs> Ket is the same as this ket with it inside because it's going to operate on it. Yeah, that's how you actually do it. So, we're almost there. Oh. What is the next? We're almost there. Let me take a look. To make it very transparent, let's do something. At this point where you have a negative, we can actually multiply by i over i. So what will that be? So dq, dt, then equals, so i over i. i times i, negative 1, and then the negative there. So we've got i over h bar. What can we do to this h? It is inside a bra. Move it to the other side. Great. And what should it become? H. H darker, right? But it is Hermitian. So we can put it now as just H with impunity. You can't do us anything. Our H is Hermitian. <laughs> yeah, yes. Are we taking the conjugate of that? or? Like I'm just pulling it out because that's the meaning of Good question. So I can show you by the sign here. It's just the meaning of this. That's the meaning. Yeah. So if you want, I can write explicitly what it should be and then claim the hemisticity. Yes. Do we need to put the H on the right side of Q? Because we're going to write Q right after, right? Don't worry. It should work. Yes. 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 That's Did I answer your question, Carter? I would think that the Q would be first. I think that's what Joe so Joey is. Yeah. Oh. Why would the Q be first? Because I, when you take the conjugate, doesn't it flip it to the other side and the Q would stay in the middle? Which Q? The Q operator. The only thing we've done, okay, the only thing we've done is to pull this out of, so we've not flipped the Q, the psi. We've not flipped size. I see what you mean. If we wanted to flip size, which is good well, idea. we didn't take the conjugate of everything. No. Okay. You, good point. You, that's what I wanted to show you. You got it. So let's make phi here. Yeah? And make H and make psi. So you guys are telling me to apply this which would have flipped this side over here and made this guy. That's not what we are doing. Okay, gotcha. That that okay? Yeah. We are only treating this, we are only getting the H out of this bra. Is that okay? But your question is very much in order because <laughs> sometimes you have to do that, okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, so, so. We've got that. Can I remove the, because it is permission? Yeah, thank you. And then I can put my Q and put psi plus, and this is where you will be happy that we did what we did. Maybe we can put this last. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll just put it last. So we did I over I, right? <laughs> so now let's do the I over I here. What do we get? I times I downstairs. Minus. So we've got a negative here. Minus, yeah, I over h bar psi q h psi. 
plus function q function t check is that okay people are happy i am happy too let's look well guys everyone hq minus q h ha ha <laughs> what is that? Computation. The commuter. The word. The commutator. Yes. yes. You see that we got the commutator mm -hmm. of H and Q. Yes. So we can write I by H for a commutator. H and Q, that is what we have the expectation value. Because each is expectation value. Plus partial Q, partial T. Without much of doing, this is good. So let's make our conclusions. We can put this in a box. This is the generalized. Every first theorem. Again, Joey, so let me correct myself now. I don't mean corrected by Joey. Watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else? Yes, please. Yes. So, can we write HQ? Uh, can we write expectation of HQ minus expectation? It's right here. Okay. HQ minus QH. That's the commutation. That's the meaning of the commutation. That's the meaning of this symbol. I can write it by the sign. We're saying it's just the definition. And the expectation value is coming just because it this HQ is, that's the definition of expectation value. So do we not need the expectation value symbol in the right equation? Which one? The one, yes. Yeah, one. But we have it here. See the expectation oh. value symbol here, because each has the expectation value. Is it clear now? Good. Can I play some tricks on you? Um, oh no, nobody wants it. <laughs> if you read a textbook and they write this, this way, DQ DT equals <coughs> Okay. Um, let's, let me get it, put it this way. Q comma H Expectation value plus partial Q, partial T, expectation value. How can we make this correct? I've made it less <coughs> of a trick. See, from our deri derivation, it is H and the Q. And the order matters. But some books write it this way. You got it. Yeah, put a negative there. Yeah, so you got it. Just, just making sure. Yeah, just, just it just happens like here at how you handle it. Okay. So let's arrive at the nice, interesting thing. If our operator, say position, <coughs> is not explicitly time dependent, so example, x is not x of t. Okay, what happens here? Goes zero. To zero. Goes to zero. And then, is x conserved? The next question, the way to handle that is simply to say, well, anyway, almost all dynamical variables that we are interested in are, do not have explicit time dependence. So position, <laughs> momentum, etc. So this is usually zero. Next, 
Ehrenfeld's generalized theorem is telling us nicely that if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, that the dynamical variable represented by that operator is conserved. Wow. <laughs> if angular momentum commutes with the Hamiltonian, then you can be sure that angular momentum is conserved. Sweet. It fits with Noether's theorem, a way to get conserved quantities. So in the homework, you are going to do this a lot. <laughs> you are going to find, for example, the commutation of XP, a product. Yeah? Which you can get as the commutation of X times P plus the commutation of P times X. So in each case, what you need is the commutation of H with X, the position, and the commutation of H. And we did an example in class, a powerful one, when we did the commutation of what? P with X, the same thing you are going to do. Remember, what was the commutation of X and P? I, H, Y. And we did it explicitly. What was our method? What was our strategy? How did we show? Find the commutation of X and P. Check your notes. Very good. That's a good place to switch back to the slides. Lecture. What lecture was that? Nine or ten? So we did the commutation, we found it. What function did we use? Once you answer, I know you are there. So we use x, we use p, and what other function? Psi. Psi. And we call that a test function. So we'll operate it on psi and see what you get. Write P in terms of X, which is negative IH bar D DX. Operate each of them on psi and according to the order and see what you get. That's what you're going to do here. Write P explicitly, write H explicitly, operate it on psi, and you will pick the expression here. You'll find that H and P do not commute. You'll find that H and X do not commute. Yeah? So, in order for you then, it, also, it simply means also something we'll do later, that they do not share eigenfunctions, which is cool. <laughs> we will see that. So, that is small hint for homework. We now turn to the slides to do some exercises with explicit matrices. Now that I still have your attention, and at a point, we take a break and complete it with Noether's theorem. Is that okay? <coughs> so please, back to the slides. Okay, very good. Said now that I have your attention, people are really like right now. Let's do the exercises that check matrices, explicit matrices. Okay. and we'll get back to Noether's theorem. So let, let's do exercises. Okay. So get ready. We've got a cat. It's a column vector. So your pens and your maybe calculator. 
We've got a bra. V is just a new symbol. It's a row vector with complex conjugates. Yeah. So this makes it clear that the bra does two things: transpose and conjugate. So can you then write this transpose conjugate of V? What as a bra, what should you, you get? You, everybody needs to work. <laughs> yeah. We've got like four problems to solve together. So write it and we see. So think of your V as your wave function, for example, as your state vector. We are building up sophistication and starting at a very simple level. We build up sophistication. Yeah, yeah, I'm at the original. Yes. Have a question? Yes. On graph B. Good question. Yes. So Millie asked a good question. Here is her. Here is Millie's question. She asks, do we apply the transpose conjugate on ket or bra v? So it is bra v. We know what this is. Yeah? So bra v is this one. So make a transpose and conjugate it and see what you get. Does that make sense? Here is our bra v. Make a transpose conjugate of it, which is the meaning of yes. the self adjunct. And there is nothing strange there because I gave you enough time for people to practice linear algebra, right? The self adjoint is what? What is the self adjoint? So, A simply means A transpose conjugate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You done? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it is. And I quite appreciate that you didn't waste your time. No, no, no. Yeah. So this shows me those who, so the who read the appendix as I gave enough time to and even gave credit for it. And then you take the complex conjugate. And then the complex conjugate. Yes. Some of you were just like, it's, it's this. You didn't even bother to do that. <laughs> it was fine with me, yeah. if you know it. But I wanted to make sure that even if you didn't know it, even if you were burdened and you didn't read it thoroughly, now no more excuse. <laughs> All right. So next step. Let's go numerical with the matrices. Given matrix operator A, find its self actual. A dagger. So transpose conjugate, which is the meaning of the Hermitian <coughs> matrix being its self adjunct. So go for it. It's right there. <laughs> I can take questions. Anyone ready, please? Yeah. <coughs> but um, these are not complex numbers. You've done the transpose. Your conjugation is not a complex conjugation. Yeah. You, you you know what I mean. It's a conjugation. It's just not a complex. Yes. yes. <laughs> it, it affects the eyes. Is that okay? Yeah. You know what I mean. Yes, please. 
Can we check our work together? Just I'm building up sophistication gently. So somebody added negative signs there. Not yet, because it is not com it is not a complex. These are real numbers. So not yet. But we'll soon do that one. So everyone got that one? Any question? Good. Let's do the next one. Now it gets more like the real thing. We've got our A, and there was a reason I had A. Look, it's a symmetric matrix, precisely a square matrix. Okay. We've got our bra, which is what it should be, a column matrix, no ordinary numbers. We've got our cat, in this case, a column vector with ordinary numbers. That's easy. So, here is the instruction. We want you now to use what you have to calculate the operation, the matrix operation of operator A on cat psi and operator O. <laughs> That's interesting. Not yet. <laughs> you didn't see it. It was too so quick here yeah, that you. <laughs> so finish that, okay? And we check. You know what to do, right? And you can work together and check your works to make it more fun. More fun. Anyone ready? Okay. Same result, right? Which proves that A equals A dagger. We got a Hermitian matrix. Good. Okay, so I'm giving enough time for everyone to be done so that it's not hurried and you can ask questions. How many are ready to check their work? Yeah. Check your work. Okay, now check your work with each other, and you'll be surprised at the differences. Yeah. Yes. Check your work with each other, please. Which, where, where are any real groups? <laughs> this group. This group. So check your work. You'll be surprised at uh -huh. That's what I. Think. <laughs> Okay, so I do row by column. Row by column. Yes, yes. I think. Yes, yeah, so the first this, element in the row multiplied by the first element in the column. Okay. Okay. Second element in the row by second element in the row. And then rotate them and multiply them by this. And then add them together. And you get the first number. And then you take the bottom two. And then rotate them in the middle. And multiply. So zero times one. And then one times two. And you add those together. So that would be zero plus two. Is two. And then you take the bottom two. And then you get 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 the bottom two. Awesome. I mean, that's, that's what I got. Does that make sense? And then whenever you're doing this, type more, you're just rotate this. Nice, nice, nice. That's what I got. Okay. So we have a new work to do. Okay. 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 Ok
check your work, please. So row by column, row by column, row by column. Yeah, see it there? Row, column. That's it there. Zero times one. Row by column. Plus, see it? One times two. Row by column. Row by column. I use my fingers when I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it works for me. What works for you? Just looking. If I keep looking, I mix it up. <laughs> okay. So, good. Everyone got it? You can check your work on my slides. So, it means then, as we said in the Dirac notation, that this is the meaning here. It's a bra. Like if you make a complex conjugation of the kit, you get it wrong. Yeah? And this works, so this is a, a little bit new for you, but it works. It's the same thing, just carrying it further. <laughs> Any question? Good. Another exercise. Okay, that's just illustrating it. Given a kit. So we've got a kit and the so summary of this explicit thing here, which is what we've been doing. Cat, the A can go in there and do the multiplication. Bra, that's what it means. When it gets in there, it's A and not A dagger. Can you see? Which is what we did in that proof. In other words, we can always pull this out over there and it becomes dagger. That is all we did. <laughs> so next one now. I go complex now. Yeah. Can I say something? This will be quite well. If you understand this, the homework can be done. But the homework can be done in a more tidy way. <laughs> this is one way to do the homework. <laughs> one of the homeworks. So I said helpful intuition for homework seven problem three two four can also start with just the equation I've given there in the book. The equation is more condensed. Yeah. So you are given that calculate a psi and a ket psi and a dagger. Okay, any group ready, please? Check, so check your work with each other.
but you have to do it <coughs> so for a a side you have to do a matrix times. That makes sense. Basically I'm a genius. And then you Ready? Ready to check your work? Any other group ready to check? Can we check? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, have you checked as a group? Check as a group. Check as a group. Can we continue then? One more minute. Wrap up, please. Sweet. Oh, oh you take that away, then you're going to okay, It's two separate elements. Yeah, I don't know what I was doing. You were trying your best. You understand what's What you've completed. So we tried. All right, so check your work, please. I will check the groups that got it. Yes, good job. All right. Oh, wait. Wait, shouldn't that 2i be plus? Yeah, wait, should, should we should we should Check carefully. <laughs> transpose conjugate. Make a transpose of it, then conjugate. Start. I usually start with the transpose. I don't know which one you prefer, but I usually transpose so that I don't make mistakes. And then when I'm done, I do the conjugation. After the transposition, I do the conjugation, then do the multiplication. And so explicitly, let me see if I can write this. Any questions so far? So, let me see if I can. So, you can use this. Okay. So, we'll do the next one. But before then, I wanted to show you. Let me show you on the board um, the quick, elegant way of what we are talking about. So, instead of writing, so this is like A. Is it equal to Q down as the question? To show that if Q is Hermitian, it is equal to this. And you can use matrices. It means you want to show that Q with elements MN equals to what? Q is Sorry? Go for it. You all see it. Star. Star. Exactly. That's what you want to show. And that's what we actually did. <laughs> okay, so you got it. And you can use that example, or you can start by writing this out, you know? For example, when I say write this out, watch it please. How can we write this out in the Dirac notation? Anybody? Can we write this out? Not to, not different from what we've done before. Not different from when we did it this way. <laughs> yeah. So you put the EM is just a number. It's just you could do <laughs> if you want to work. Or you could. 
Yeah, the reason the book lies like something like EN is to connect it with what you know in classical mechanics about unit vectors. Yeah, it makes intuition. So EN Q yeah, and E and yeah, you flip it. That's what we've been doing. So next one. <coughs> This is interesting. This takes us further into what we will need later on. This is usually, so we've done the thing I needed us to do in preparation for the homework due on Saturday. This one is just taking things further. So I've done most of it for you. <laughs> just to see if you can then apply it here. So the projection operator projects the part of psi in the direction of phi. I've done it before. A state vector, let's say diagonal vector. There is the horizontal projection, there is the vertical projection. That's what the projection operator does. And that means Psi can be explained as a linear combination of these, see? Which is what we mean, given any psi. And now the projection operator enables us to pick the components of psi that are in this two direction. <laughs> and what would P1 be? P1 will pick the components of psi that are phi1, yeah. And so we just want the components of psi in the P2 direction, or the projection of psi in direction 2. That's what we want. And C direction 2 right there. See it there? Which I've put there. And where is psi? Right there. So get the result. Straightforward. Anyone ready? Zero, two. Excellent. <laughs> Jared likes this whole stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and many of you as well. It's not bad at all. You can, which is, so that ends up being zero and two, as Jared said. <laughs> it's sweet, isn't it? But you must practice, if not, okay? So other hints, problem 3A, use lecture 12. I have, we did exercise. If you remember that exercise where people were thinking, I think, I think one person got a jury and every other person was not. Wow. Um, where we actually, yeah, it's true. Jury got it because he could see that there is a psi at x comma zero. And the question was previous to x comma zero, previous time. So he then expressed psi in its full glory with the wiggly factor of e to the negative i e h bar over 2. Yeah? Once you do that, you get started there. So that's what we do. And then there is the one that is, I expect you to ask me. <laughs> and I do that in a few of the homeworks. It's a nice challenge. Because the course is designed as a 500 level course. It cannot be correctly taught as a 300 level course. <laughs> there must be homework in which you are stuck, <laughs> some of them. <laughs> that is how it is done. That is how the book is written. That is how we learn further. And that is why the grades I give for the homework is just 10%. <laughs> so that it doesn't affect you too much. That's the way. And then as you go further into graduate courses, yeah, because this is open to graduates as well then many homeworks become even more open-ended. <laughs> All right. So before we switch into the Emmy Noita part, our part three for today, joke. <laughs> Who gets the joke now? <laughs> there are some jokes that only physics students can get, right? <laughs> so what is the joke here? 
the Heisenberg Department of Physics. <laughs> <laughs> because of the uncertainty principle. We're not even sure if you are here. You are probably here. <laughs> so probably we'll have a fall break, right? <laughs> What's the probability? It's very high, though. <laughs> okay, let's do Noitha. And I will be fast with Emmy Noitha. It's more like the kind of stuff. Here is where this is heading. Act limiting. I usually ask students to pick their choice, whatever they found interesting, and they ask me and I will give a lecture on it. That is not covered in any of this. One of the best that I really liked was when they asked me to do the Dirac equation. Because the Dirac equation, so Schrodinger equation is non-relativistic. It's non-relativistic quantum mechanics. The Dirac equation is relativistic quantum mechanics. Takes into consideration relativity. Yeah. <laughs> so we sure. quickly did that. Yeah. Sure. So the other time it was spin, applications of spin in communication. That was last year. It was also super cool. Yeah. And so that's one reason I'm doing the Noether theorem in case you pick it up. Another reason is this. Where is the paper? Where is your paper supposed to come? I'm going to write extra as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> In case you like it, that can become your paper. So, already begin to plan. Yeah. And I usually enjoy reading those papers because you guys proof, wow. <laughs> you, you have your part you like and you take it and you learn a lot and you make me read from you your explorations. So let's quickly then keep this simple. Um, just as some of you said, Noether's theorem, homogeneity of space leads to conservation laws. There shouldn't be a, re a difference in the experiments I do in Nigeria and the United States and the UK and the Germany, all places I studied. Yeah, I actually do experiments like that. I carry some of my equipment and do this experiment and I get the same result. It shouldn't be. And what does that tell me? Homogeneity of space. Linear momentum is conserved. And if it doesn't matter the direction, angular momentum. Yeah. And if it doesn't matter the time, yeah, then energy is conserved. So, in terms of quantum mechanics, to show this, to make this happen mathematically, a fact of physics, we need a time translation operator. A time translation. Of course, we know the position operator. We know the momentum operator. So for people to do good, advanced, time-dependent quantum mechanics, they use a time translation operator. Again, we already know a position operator that we can use to apply on the square of the wave function and get the probability of finding the particle somewhere. We already know a momentum operator that we can use on the square of the wave function to find the probability of the linear momentum of the system? How about time? That's the reason. So, it's a bit involved, but it works. So time translation will lead to conservation of energy. Space translation, linear momentum. It doesn't matter where you do it. Rotation, doesn't matter the direction. So. Those operators exist in quantum mechanics. And I will quickly motivate, I'm not sure, I'll just motivate how such a translation is done. And that allows us to start by revising Noether's theorem. States that any differentiable symmetry of, an, of action, that means law of a physical system has a corresponding conservation law, we say it. Yeah? Space invariance. Doesn't matter if I do it here or here. What is conserved? Linear moment. Okay. So we've done that part. Okay. In quantum mechanics, then it means we take the state vector. We have an operator that corresponds to the observable we are measuring at location A. 
Can we do and get the same thing at location A prime? That's it. And that is obtained mathematically by the transformation. It's just the transformation of the matrices. A map of one onto the other. The map of the system. That's how it is achieved in quantum mechanics. And the operator that enables us to do that mapping is called the unitary operator. Very cool. That's what the unitary operator can do. It can take psi onto psi prime, allowing us to show that in the end, the eigenvalues we get here will correspond to the same eigenvalues here, proving time translational invariance, and therefore conservation of energy. So how are we going to derive it? Yeah, a little bit it's involved, but that's what we get. It's U gamma U equals one. And this one is actually a matrix, it's a unitary matrix. All diagonal elements are one. You know what I'm saying. So it can be done, and it can be done by some expansion, Taylor expansion, to do it. And I'm, I have it on my slides, which you can look at. It's not really a big part of the lecture. But the intuition you get is that this unitary operator is an exponential in the Hamiltonian. So when you get <laughs> matrices with elements in the exponent, you shouldn't be scared. You are going to see a lot of them in advanced quantum mechanics. So what this unitary operator is basically doing, which is a little bit, it gives you an expression similar to one of the remote challenging handles. So what this unitary operator is basically doing is to cause a rotation in time. Yeah. It can actually rotate the system. <laughs> you like time translation. See? And it fits, it does that with the Hamiltonian. And remember what happens to this guy. It goes away when you do psi star psi. So it doesn't matter whether this guy is there, because you have two of them being one. If you do the complex conjugate, you've got U operator and U dagger will then be plus right there. Can you see? And that gives you one. <laughs> but at the same time, this U dagger, U will map your weight state vector onto a different basis, onto a different system, showing the conservation of energy. It's just sweet, but I agree, I haven't given you all the details, okay? So, those are there, we can go back to it. So, let's wrap up what I've already said in connection with the art editing topic. So, if this makes you remember the contribution of a minority to physics, great. If not, perhaps you might arrange for us to discuss in office hours, or we can do it also as part of art editing. The last time I explained a minority's theorem, this is what I get. This is just for fun. <laughs> I got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At the end of the class. I think it was... That was a long time ago. Guess how long? And this, it was here in Creighton University. Guess how long? When I was a TA. <laughs> it turns out that that is actually when I took this course I'm teaching now. 2006. Yeah. Wow. 15 no. years ago. Is that about? Yeah. 15. 2006, not 16. No, I, was, I was five. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it seems like yesterday to me. Oh, how time flies. <laughs> so we got there, and we have a few minutes for questions in general. I didn't want to leave us hanging, so. Questions? Yes. What should we be thinking about for the project paper? I'm sorry? What should we be thinking about for the project? The project, yes, the project paper. So what interests you, what fits your career goals, and what will allow you to do all that is described about the project paper. And usually that is where students catch up if they didn't do very well on exam one or two, because it's really possible to get a 98 there. The, I have posted the grading scheme, what is it called, the rubrics, if you follow it. I write a solid paper in the style of physics, publishable paper like 
papers in physical review, and usually you guys do it. <laughs> I just enjoy reading it. I can I tell you a few papers in the past. One guy did, um, I think he's Max. Max Downs. Max works with um, um, Dr. Barut because his research has to do with magnetic spins and things like that. He did a beautiful paper on how to use spin in quantum mechanics for storage devices and in view of spintronics, something I just introduced barely in lecture. So from spin and spin as a quantum number to spintronics, replacing electronics. And he picked it up, gave you a nice, wonderful paper on it. So that's an example. You pick something that interests you, relevant for your career. Maybe biomedical physics people. Um, last year, some of them picked something like NMR. Aha, uh -huh, which reminds me. Let's wrap up the class with your experience with the MRI. I told you at the beginning of class, when we call it NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, people were avoiding it. The name was changed to magnetic resonance imaging. People started taking it. The basis is spin, which shows up in an external magnetic field. Tell us your experience of MRI. Yeah, I had to get an MRI Tuesday, and um, I don't know. We just talked about how the Pauli exclusion principle is to spin up and spin down, and um, and when you're in that external magnetic field, that big ring, it's really loud. And, the magnetic field is going pretty crazy. Uh, all those states just line up or anti line up, up or down. And Correct. That produces the images. So. Exactly. And they inject you with a little thing that localizes at where they want to see the images. Yeah, the yeah. contrast eye. <laughs> yes, the contrast. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Super cool. It's real. And now he's here to prove that the device works. Right, the well, well, mechanics <laughs> works. Well, see well, you. Well. Enjoy your breath. <laughs> I'll do that for you. I can just feel it. Oh, honey. Oh, God. <laughs> He's finished.